All right, this here is a picture of Charles Stewart, also known as King James. This man here is responsible for authorizing the King James Version of the Bible that came out back in 1611, during the 1600s. The King James Version of the Bible is the best version out to this very day. The reason is because the English words written in the King James Version of the Bible can be traced back to the original writings of the Old and New Testament, which are Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Now, of course, there are some problems with the King James Version of the Bible. It's not perfect. And trust me, this man had nothing to do with that because once he passed away, there were scribes, wicked scribes, mentioned in Jeremiah 8.8, 8, they got a hold of our literature and they changed a lot of the words, especially the names of the Heavenly Father and His Son. But other than that, the King James Bible is pretty much one of the best versions, the best version out. So with that being said, I want to show you the title of this book. Yes, it's a book with a picture of King James on it. The title of this book is King James the Sixth and First in the Reunion of Christendom. And as you can see by the image, this man does not look like a white man. As most sites here online and other portraits of him like to portray him as. This man looks like a light-skinned brother, doesn't he? That's because he is from the tribe of Ephraim, the mixed tribe of Israel. Remember, Joseph, a white Hebrew, married an Egyptian woman, a sister, and they produced light-skinned babies. As it says in the Bible, Ephraim is a cake not turned. It is not dark and it is not white. It is in between. So yes, this man has Hebrew and Hermetic DNA in him, hence the woolly hair, the Hermetic fe features in him. So don't believe the lies that he was a homosexual and a Freemason. He wasn't. You see, the Terrors knew that this man was anointed by the Creator. So once he passed away, they got a hold of the literature and they changed some things. They smeared and defamed King James, saying he was a homosexual, saying he was all that. Now, we don't know. He might have been involved in some sin, and they might have just put it out there to put him on blast. We don't know that. Nevertheless, we can't go by what they say. We got to go by what true history tells concerning this man. I, in I initially believed that this man was all that until I researched this stuff myself. And I mean, a picture's worth a thousand words. Now, there are some people out there that, because he's, he appears to be hermetic, right? In some areas, they take it too far and say that all Israel was all black or hermetic or whatever. No, it was just Ephraim and Manasseh. Remember, again, Joseph, white Hebrew, married a sister, an Egyptian woman, a black woman, and produced two childs with that woman. Ephraim and Manasseh and they were assigned the title or the moniker Israel Yasharel so once Judah and Ephraim two leaders of two kingdoms they split there was fighting going on between them so the northern kingdom comprised of the ten tribes of Israel led by Ephraim and the southern kingdom comprised of mostly Judah and Benjamin, they split at one time. They've been split for a long time now. They're being brought together now, and they're the same banner and moniker. They split, so Ephraim was heading the ten tribes. Judah was heading the house of Judah, which are comprised of three tribes, the tribe of Phares, Sarah, and Shelah, Benjamin, and this man comes from, again, Ephraim. You could tell by the way he looks. He wasn't white. I know they like to whitewash King James the way he looked and all that, but that's just to, 
to mess with your head. It's a psyops. We're in the time of the Gentiles, so you could expect things to get whitewashed. Okay? So yeah, he's not from the tribe of Judah. He may appear to be from the tribe of Judah, but, but he's not. Clearly, he's not. If you do your research, you'll see that he is from Ephraim. And I'm going to prove that. And here you have King James once again. Same picture I showed you previously, only this one here has a different color to it. Here you see Charles Stewart, a.k.a. King James, holding a scepter on his right hand. And on his left, he's holding a sphere with a cross on top of it. He's also wearing a robe and a crown. Very important that you pay attention to these things because this lets you know that he comes from a royal, kingly lineage. Now, there are some individuals that might get confused and think he comes from the tribe of Judah because in Scripture, the tribe of Judah is referred to as the kingly tribe. However, that's not the case. Remember, when the twelve tribes of Israel split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom was led by Ephraim. So when the split happened, Ephraim was raised to a position of kingship. Someone had to lead the northern kingdom, and it was Ephraim. It was prophesied that Ephraim would become a multitude of great nations, and it was prophesied that Ephraim would become even greater than his older brother Manasseh. The two sons of Joseph are Ephraim and Manasseh. Hence why here King James looks the way he does. He is a descendant of Joseph, one of the patriarchs of the twelve tribes of Israel. So no, he was not a Jew. He is not from Judah. He is an Ephraimite. Okay, here you have some prophecies concerning the two sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. This is Genesis chapter 48, verses 8 through 20, King James Version. Verse 8 says that Israel, also known as Jacob, beheld Joseph's sons, his grandchildren, and he said, Who are these? He didn't know who they were. Verse 9, Joseph, Jacob's son, one of the sons of Jacob. Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons, whom Yah had given me in this place. And Jacob said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Verse 10, Now, the eyes of Israel, a.k.a. Jacob, were dim for age, so that he could not see, and he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. Verse 11, And Israel, a.k.a. Jacob, said unto his son Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, and lo, Yah has showed me also thy seed. So Ephraim and Manasseh, are Israel Jacob's grandchildren. Verse 12, Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. Verse 13, Verse 13, Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right, towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. Verse 14, And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. For Manasseh was the firstborn. Remember, the firstborn initially got the double portion. They got the best portion because they were the firstborn, the rights of the firstborn. However, Joseph's dad here is reversing the order. He's going to bless the younger child more than the elder. Verse 15 says, And he blessed Joseph and said, Yah before whom my father Abraham Isaac did walk, the Yah which fed me all my life long unto this day. Verse 16, The angel which redeemed me from all evil blessed the lads. Pay attention to this word here. The word lads, that is an English word, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? 
It is an English word to describe toddlers or youngins, which were the two sons of Joseph. They were young children at the time. But that is an English word. Okay? And it says, Let my name, what name? The name Israel. Remember, Jacob had his name changed to Israel. So here he's saying, Let my name, the name Israel, be named on them. So Ephraim and Manasseh hold the moniker or title Yasharel, Israel. It was given to them by Israel, aka Jacob. So the name Israel was named upon them, and the name of Jacob's fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And he's saying, let them, meaning Ephraim and Manasseh, grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now think nations and countries here. When it says, let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth, think of countries, nations. Okay? So there are nations of Ephraim and Manasseh on this earth that are present with us today. Can you identify them? Again, here are clues what type of nations they are. Lads, two lads, a multitude of nations in the midst of the earth. What kind of nations? Well, again, the word lads is an English word. Hint, hint. And lad again means a child, a youngin. Okay? It means a toddler. Verse 17. Verse 17 says that when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. Why? Because he was going to give the double portion to Ephraim when Joseph was accustomed to the tradition of the elder receiving the double portion. So it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. Verse 18, Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put your right hand upon his head. Verse 19, His father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations so they would become a multitude of nations nationalities countries verse 20 and he blessed them that day saying and these shall Israel bless saying Yah make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh or Yah make thee as Israel remember Ephraim and Manasseh carry the moniker Israel and he set Ephraim before Manasseh. So yeah, Ephraim received the double portion, the greater portion, before Manasseh, his older brother. Okay? Now we're going to take a look at some of these verses here. And we're going to gather clues to identify who Ephraim and Manasseh are in the earth today. Okay, let's go to verse 18, I mean 19. Okay? Here it says that Manasseh was to become a people. And it was prophesied that Manasseh would become great. Okay? That's another clue that we're going to examine. Okay, here you have two key verses that will help you identify who Ephraim and Manasseh are in the earth today. First verse is from Genesis 48 and 19. The first part of this verse prophesies that Manasseh would become a great nation in the earth. And it is no coincidence that Great Britain has... The word great contained within. It is hinting at the fact that Ephraim and Manasseh are English-speaking nations. 
Do you have the eyes to see this? Do you have the ears to hear what I'm saying? And do you have the mind to comprehend what you're seeing on screen? The second part of Genesis 48 and 19 says that Manasseh's younger brother Ephraim would become even greater than he and that Ephraim's seed would become a multitude of nations, English-speaking nations, and the earth. Now, turning over to Isaiah 28 and 1. Woe to the crown of pride. The word crown is a term used to describe the English monarchy of Great Britain. Again, more hints. So, woe to the crown of pride, referring to the Illuminati English monarchs that have usurped the heritage of Ephraim. And woe to the drunkards of Ephraim, the true Ephraimites who are spiritually drunk on lies and ignorance, whose glorious beauty, their blessings, is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat bellies of them that are overcome with wine. So, King James was an English monarch from England. Scotland, he represented the monarchy back in the day in the times of the Dark Ages. Why did they call him the Dark Ages? Because it was ruled by the children of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. So the term dark is in reference to Ephraim and Manasseh who carry hermetic genes in them. So they just like to make people believe that it was the dark ages because people weren't as advanced as they are today but in reality it's a cold word dark to refer to the skin color of some of these brothers from Ephraim again just more psyops from the powers that shouldn't be and here you have a screenshot of various English speaking countries you have Canada England New Zealand, Australia, and last but not least, the United States of America. Now, when you look at these English-speaking countries, think about the prophecies that were written about Ephraim and Manasseh. It was prophesied that Manasseh would become a great nation. The word great is contained within Great Britain. Now, I'm not saying that Manasseh is Great Britain. No, I'm simply stating that Ephraim and Manasseh, the two brothers, are English-speaking countries. Alright? There are some that speculate that Manasseh is the United States of America, and that may be true. Who knows? There are some that say that Ephraim are the English colonized nations, such as England, New Zealand, Australia, so on and so forth, because they say that Ephraim was prophesied to become a multitude of great nations, and that is a fact. That may very well be the reality, but we don't know for sure. So I'll leave that up to you. You decide. Who do you think is Ephraim and who do you think is Manasseh? I mean, America can be considered a great nation as well, but we know that Great Britain is more renowned than America, even though America today is enjoying a lot of popularity. But it was prophesied that Ephraim will become a multitude of great nations, might be English-speaking nations, part of Great Britain. I believe that may be the proper interpretation of the prophecy, but nevertheless, Ephraim and Manasseh today are English nations. Here's another screenshot of the English-speaking nations throughout the world. You have the UK, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the USA. The people of Ephraim and Manasseh can be found scattered throughout these nations. The USA is a much younger nation than the UK, so therefore some speculate that Ephraim is the United States of America. I don't know. I can't say for sure. Others believe it is Manasseh. Uh, the UK, some say that because they are various 
English colonized nations throughout the earth that they are Ephraim because it was prophesied that Ephraim would become a multitude of great nations, renowned nations. The UK has a rich, richer history than the US. The US is young, it is also considered a great nation. So, you know, there's a dilemma who's Ephraim, who's Manasseh? Maybe both are Ephraim. We don't know that. Maybe Manasseh's Canada. Who knows? But yes, Ephraim and Manasseh are scattered throughout these nations. And here's a mark work from the opening pages of the 1611 King James Bible. As you can see, it is artwork from back in the day. Very distinct. And here's a screenshot of all the books found within the original 1611 King James Version of the Bible. As you can see, the original King James Version of the Bible had the Apocrypha in it. Today's versions, they don't have the Apocrypha. They removed the Apocrypha and set it to the side. So you got to get it separately. Not only that, but some like to label the Apocrypha as being uninspired. And I don't know how that could be if it was part of the original version for crying out loud. The reason some like to label the Apocrypha as being uninspired is because the powers that shouldn't be don't want you reading it. The Apocrypha has key prophecies that will help you understand what is going on in our world today. Not only that, but it will help you identify who the wicked are. So they don't want you reading the Apocrypha. They want to discourage you from reading it by labeling it as being uninspired. But don't believe the hype. It is very much inspired. And it was part of the original version. Also, the original 1611 King James Version of the Bible had the Heavenly Father's name within some of its verses. Today's versions of the King James Bible, they don't have the Heavenly Father's name. They removed it. So today's versions of the King James Bible are not the same as the original 1611 version. You must understand that. And King James had nothing to do with that. The fact that today's versions of the Bible only have 66 books, that should send up a major red flag in your mind, letting you know that something's up. The original 1611 King James Version of the Bible had way more than 66 books. And why do we only have 66 books today? Well, you could thank the wicked scribes mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 8 for that. They're the ones that have been messing with the Bible throughout the centuries. And here's a screenshot of Psalms 84 and part of Psalms 83 and 85. This is from the original 1611 King James Bible. If you take a look at the last verse of Psalms 83, you'll see that that verse contains the name of the Creator. Psalms 83:18. It reads that men may know that thou whole name alone is Yehovah, the Most High over all the earth. There it is. The original 1611 King James Version of the Bible has the name of the Creator within it. The name that was removed from all modern versions of the King James Bible. Alright, so in closing, I'll leave you with this image here of James Charles Stewart, which is the proper name of King James. Most people don't know that. They don't know that this man was a descendant of Jacob. He was a descendant of one of the sons of Jacob, Joseph, who was one of the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the purpose of me bringing forth this information is so that I can help wake up the people of Israel to their true heritage and also in order to help you converts that are considered Gentiles according to the flesh to help you understand that some of the imagery of the saints has been whitewashed by the powers that shouldn't be 
They've been distorting history throughout time and in some cases rewriting it. So it is very important that you investigate carefully the origins of some of the images of the saints so that you aren't deceived. Clearly this man looks like a brother from another mother. He is an Israelite. He was a king that ruled Scotland, England, and other nearby countries back in the 1600s during the times of the Dark Ages. Dark as in reference to dark people or light-skinned people ruling those ages. So yeah, I hope you find the information valuable. Feel free to share. As always, nothing but love. And I wish you nothing but blessings. Till next time. Shalom.